Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Adina Tari, and I'm a first-year PhD student and a first-year gastroenterology resident at the Institute of Pancreatic Diseases. My uh, supervisor is Balint Erős, and my SMS is Anatrans, and my vision is to improve patient care in acute gastrointestinal diseases. I would like to show you today two of my ongoing projects. My first project is about investigating how does the morphology of the papilla affect by the cannulation outcomes and adverse events, which is a systematic review and meta-analysis. And my second project is about the early resuscitation of the hemodynamically unstable gastrointestinally bleeding patients, which has uh, two parts. The first part is a protocol for an RCT, and the second part is the feasibility trial uh, for the RCT. So first, let me talk more detailed about my first project, which is, as I mentioned, about how does the morphology of the major papilla affect by duct cannulation outcomes and adverse events. So as you can all know, ERCP is the most common therapeutic procedure for pancreatobiliary disorders. However, how to best achieve a safe and effective bidac cannulation is still a debated question. And the scope is doing ERCP routinely recognize the difference in the macroscopic appearance of the papilla. This has led to a conception that certain appearances are more difficult to cannulate and therefore more prone to adverse events. The first validated classification of the macroscopical appearance of the papilla was published by a Scandinavian research group in 2019. They differentiated four types, and they found that certain types were more difficult to cannulate, and the incidence of adverse events were higher in these papilla types. Our aim is to determine the influence of papilla morphology on ERCP outcomes and adverse events. So our clinical question is then, how does the morphology of the major papilla affect by the cannulation outcomes and adverse events? Our condition were difficult cannulation, cannulation failure, the number of cannulation items and cannulation times, and the incidence of adverse events in the context of the papilla morphology in adult patients undergoing ERCP with a native papilla. And our hypothesis were that certain morphologies can predict a more difficult cannulation and a higher chance of developing the different adverse events. We conducted our systematic search in three databases at the end of September with the following search key. And we could identify almost 7,000 articles, and from that, 36 articles were eligible for full-text selection. And in the end, we could include 17 articles to the systematic review, and from that, we could include 14 analyses um, to the meta-analytical calculations. So here you can see the summary of my outcomes. Our outcome measure was the pooled event rate with a 95% confidence intervals, and the meta-analytical calculation were possible in four of the eight outcomes. And we conducted two analyses in each case. In the first analysis, we included um, articles only using the horizon classification, and I would like to show you two of, my, uh, two of these forest plots uh, for you today. And the other analysis, we included every uh, articles which use the horizon classification or other classification systems comparable to the horizon one. So here you can see one of my forest plots, which is about the pooled event rate of difficult cannulation. This is a clinically relevant question because the higher the rate of difficult cannulation, the higher the chance for developing the different adverse events. So in the forest plot, you can see the pooled event rate of difficult cannulation in the different papilla types below each other. For example, in case of type 2 papilla, it was 0.39, which means that endoscopists will experience 39% of the patients with type 2 papilla difficult cannulation. So I think the main message of this forest plot is that in type 1 papilla, compared to the other papilla types, the event rate of difficult cannulation was significantly lower compared to the other three papilla types. It can be interpreted in several ways uh, to the clinical practice, but I think one of um, the main message is that trainees should start their practice with type 1 papilla. And you can see that um, the results were not statistically significant, however, the p-value refers for a higher tendency, and unfortunately, the heterogeneity was high. It could be due to the fact that uh, there were some uh, differences in the definition used for um, difficult cannulation in the different articles. 
So I would like to show you one of my other forest plots, which is about the pooled event rate of post-TRCP pancreatitis. The structure of the forest plot is the same. You can see the pooled event rate of post-TRCP pancreatitis in the different papilla types below each other. And um, the main message of this forest plot is that in type 2 papilla, the event rate of post-TRCP pancreatitis was significantly higher compared to the other papilla types, which means that uh, these patients should be observed um, more closely uh, after the post-TRCP procedure, the RCP procedure. And you can see that in this case, uh, the p-value refers for a statistically significant result, and total homogeneity was observed. There were many strengths of our analysis. For example, it was a comprehensive study, and um, the risk of bias uh, was low, and no publication bias was detected. However, there were some limitations. For example, as I have mentioned, like there were some differences in the clinical definition, and we included uh, mostly retrospective analysis. And in conclusion, differentiating between the different papilla types is clinically relevant because certain morphological variants can predict a higher rate of difficult cannulation and therefore a higher rate of adverse events. And the manuscript is finished and currently it's under review in our target journal, which is the GI endoscopy. And let me talk uh, very briefly about my second project, which is about the resuscitation of the hemodynamically unstable gastrointestinally bleeding patients. So acute gastrointestinal bleeding is a potentially life-threatening event, often requiring emergency medical care. One in four patients will develop hemodynamic instability, which is associated with higher bleeding and uh, mortality rate. However, the recommendations in the guidelines regarding these patients' early care are insufficient. We conducted a systematic search to identify especially articles about vasopressor use in, in these patients. And we could identify only one article, which was an RCT connected among uh, patients with uh, gastrointestinal bleeding in the state of shock requiring ICU care. And in the intervention arm, this patient received a limited fluid resuscitation combined with vasopressor use compared to the flu uh, standard fluid resuscitation in the control arm. And you can see that um, the resuscitation time and uh, basically all the other outcomes were better in the, um, in the arm uh, where the patients received the restrictive fluid resuscitation combined with vasopressor use. So our um, plan is to conduct an open label to an RCT with a superiority study design. Our patients will be the hemodynamically unstable patient with an acute gastrointestinal bleeding. And in the intervention arm, these patients will receive combined fluid and vasopressor resuscitation compared to the standard fluid resuscitation therapy. And our primary outcome will be the resuscitation time. And uh, first, we would like to conduct a feasibility study with 10, 10 patients in both arms. So in summary, my first project is finished and uh, currently under review in our target journal. And uh, I'm waiting for the ethical approval for the feasibility study for the second project. And let's hope that it will be conducted uh, in the autumn. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. Let the future tell the truth and evaluate it, each one according to his work and accomplishments. The present is theirs. The future for which I have very worked is mine. Thank you for the really interesting presentation. I would like to ask you a clarification question about your second forest plot. I mean, maybe if you could go back, I don't know if you can, uh, to that figure. So this one, yeah. Um, what exactly is this uh, p-value? I mean, what, what, are the, what is uh, compared to what? I'm not, not really clear for me, sorry. Thank you. So, thank you for your question. I'm not sure that I understand it correctly. So in the forest plot, you can see the pooled uh, event rate uh, of post-TRCP pancreatitis. 
in the different papilla types. So in this one is for type 1 papilla and below it for type 2 and um, after the type 3 and type 4. So and they compared with each other to each other. Thank you, Idina, for your presentation. I think this, this p-value is for the subgroup differences. Yeah. Uh, so there was like a significant difference between the subgroups. Uh, my question is, uh, could you tell us some examples how different authors define difficult cannulations? Yeah, thank you for your question. So most studies use the um, Ashga definition, which means that uh, more than five attempts or more than five minutes or uh, the cannulation of the pancreatic duct at least two times. But however, like some studies uh, excluded time. They used uh, the definition like um, more than five, cannulating the papilla more than five times or the pancreatic duct at least two times. Okay, thank you. And another question for the, the first uh, forest plot. I am not sure if I got this right, but you highlighted type one. Yeah. And I can see that type four has the highest rate of difficult cannulation. Yes, but um, the difference between type two and type four is, in my opinion, it's like not that much. Like uh, in um, type one papilla, uh, it's much more lower compared to the other three types. So that's why I highlighted that. Okay, thank you so much. Congratulations. Regarding your second project, the PICO, if you would like to show us, please, what's going to be the cutoff value of what um, uh, clinical criteria you are going to use when you are going to separate patients who are going to get just standard fluid resuscitation or combined with vasopressor because we are talking about hemodynamically unstable patients altogether. So um, uh, for uh, defining patient in the, uh, who are hemodynamically unstable, we will use the new score and the lactate level. Yeah, there will be like below um, two or above four, but also there will be a cutoff level to defining patient in the state of shock. So if their lactate level will be um, high or the new score, new score will be uh, above a certain level, like these patients will also be excluded because um, we believe that they need a vasopressor regarding um, this uh, project. Congratulations as well. Uh, just a quick question regarding the first article that you found for this uh, second project. Uh, they used dopamine as a vasopressor, yeah. if I understood. What about your study? Would you only use dopamine or noradrenaline, or what's your uh, decision? Thank you. We will, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we will use noradrenaline, not dopamine. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Congratulations on it. I was wondering about the I square zero uh, percent. So, and you have quite a few uh, studies. So, how did this uh, result came out here about the heterogeneity? Um, like the statistician calculated the heterogeneity, and like it was zero total homogeneity was absurd because there were like no big differences between the different articles. But could you conclude that the, the that the, the population was so homogeneous that that it's zero percent, or or does it have another reason? Um, it was like homogeneous, like for example, every patient were adult patients with a native papilla and the definition for pancreatitis was the same. So yeah, I, I can say that uh, the populations were homogeneous. Thank you.